This time on Heartland Highways, we're off to the Vermilion County War Museum in Danville. Housed in the city's original public library building, the museum displays memorabilia and artifacts from the Revolutionary War to Operation Iraqi Freedom. The next stop features scenic views. Miram, Indiana's Bluff Park overlooks the Wabash River and Illinois farm fields. And finally, the Museum of Miniature Houses in Carmel, Indiana features over 600 miniatures. The eye-catching details are a must-see, so stay tuned. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits. Opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning. Available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114. Hello and welcome back to Heartland Highways. For our first story, we head to Danville, Illinois, where we spent the better part of a day at the Vermilion County War Museum. With over 25,000 artifacts, there was plenty to see and film for this story. Run entirely by volunteers, the museum opened their doors in 1999. Today, they have displays of artifacts, photographs, and uniforms from the Revolutionary War all the way up to the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. And it's all housed in a historic and distinctive Danville landmark. What once held books now holds history. Visitors to the Vermilion County War Museum can not only see, but also touch and learn about the history of war. This was the original Carnegie Library for Danville. Uh, it was built in 1903. Uh, money for the most part was donated by Andrew Carnegie, still, still magnet at that time. They gave money all over the United States to the development of uh, different libraries and uh, mostly rural areas and stuff. Uh, building for this museum was acquired in the late 1990s by uh, several veteran organizations that went together that wanted to develop the museum. Uh, they came in and basically gutted this building out and refurbished it in its entirety. The building required a great deal of restoration and renovation. Many of the original details from the library were kept intact, including bookshelves, stained glass windows, and fireplaces. When completed in 1999, museum volunteers were left with 14,000 square feet of display space. The day that we opened up was uh, 1999 on November 11th. This building was basically empty. We hardly had anything on display in here except for uh, a cu couple tables and a few shelves and some uh, coat racks that had a few uniforms on it. Here we are, 2013, and we are overflowing out the doors. We get stuff donated to us almost every single day. One of the rarest artifacts in the museum was close to being tossed into the garbage. This lady had come in, she was actually going to throw it in the dumpster if we didn't want it. She said, I see a dumpster in the library parking lot, and I'll take this trunk and throw it away. And it's a uh, World War I 5th Marine uniform, which it, it, we got the complete kit, uh, and it's extremely rare and valuable. There were very few Marines in World War I. Marines only fought with the 2nd Division, uh, so that it wasn't like you know there were a million Marines in World War I. So their uniforms are probably the most sought after of all World War I collectibles today. The artifacts that make up the museum are donated or on loan from collectors. Each war has its own display area, starting with the American Revolution. Uh, we've got a, a, a good display, mostly of my reenactment uh, equipment stuff, plus a few original items from my collection from the Revolutionary War, as it pertained to Illinois. Not, no, very few people know that Illinois was uh, involved in the American Revolution. George Rogers Clark. Uh, had led a, uh, a unit here uh, from Kentucky into uh, southern Illinois at Fort Massac. They crossed uh, Shawnee National Forest in, uh, just about this time and arrived at uh, Cahokia on the 4th of July. The following winter, they trekked back across southern Illinois and captured Fort, uh, Fort Vincennes, or Post Vincent. 
uh, out of the outcoming of that capture of that fort back from the British, uh, the United States acquired uh, not only the state of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and, and uh, parts of Wisconsin. Uh, if it hadn't been for him, uh, those five states might not be part of the United States today. The local Civil War reenactors group have loaned several items for this display, including uniforms and photographs. Uh, next, in that room, we have our uh, World War I collection, uh, which is, like I say, probably one of the largest ones that you'll see in any museum, where you can actually get up and you can touch the material, the, the wool uniforms, and see how uncomfortable that material would have been when you were wearing it. Our next, we go to the south room over here to my left, and it is the World War II room. Every item that you see, uh, and we're still searching in there to make sure everything is correct in that room, uh, belonged from World War II time period. Uh, we have a little room uh, associated with World War II that we just opened up two weeks ago called our uh, USS Harding D-Day room. Uh, it had, contains the collection of the ship, uh, the USS Harding, that one of our volunteers uh, that will be actually be in here today had served at D-Day. Uh, his ship supported the Second Rangers. Uh, we also have some uniforms and other artifacts in there uh, that pertain to any veteran that served at D-Day. The Korean War display showcases a two-man tent with gear and rations. According to Ron, Korean War artifacts are hard to distinguish because many of the items were World War II surplus. The Vietnam collection contains deep sea diving gear, handbooks, and the famous Zippo lighter. A special display room is dedicated to POWs and a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, we have a Congressional Medal of Honor on display in there that was awarded to a uh, World War II Danville native, Major uh, Kenneth Bailey, a U.S. Marine that was killed during World War II. Uh, we also have artifacts from an uh, awful lot of other Vermilion County pe uh, soldiers that were prisoners of war, uh, both under German and, and Japan occupation. Desert Storm, Iraq, and Afghanistan are also represented in the museum with uniforms, supplies, and other artifacts. The first floor of the museum houses the main collection, while the lower level serves as a library and research facility. Here you'll find books, a newspaper collection, scrapbooks, and a collection of radio gear from various decades of war. There's more in storage that's not on display just yet. Displays change on a regular basis, and visitors are encouraged to get up close and touch most of the items. For the most part, you can come in here, you can handle the, the items. Uh, and they, they always comment on that, you know, we, we go to a, a big museum in Chicago, or St. Louis or somewhere else, uh, you're not going to be able to go up and, and put your hands on a uniform and feel the texture of the material or pick up that pair of jump boots or take that helmet and put that helmet on, see how heavy that helmet is. Uh, that's one unique thing that we have here. The museum is run entirely by volunteers. Some are veterans, while others just have an appreciation for history, like Chaz Fitzsimmons, who rides its bike several times a week to and from the museum. I come here for the fascination of history of our, basically our continent, our world, and it just gives me uh, free time. And when I come here, I usually give tours, I clean, and I do some fun oh, stuff yeah. as well. Well, it's always a good thing to volunteer your time. It keeps you out of trouble and it gives you a better understanding of why you're here and it gives you a perspective upon life. Our volunteers here are, are, are starting to, uh, we're starting to, to, to grow an, a, a whole new group of volunteers. Most of our volunteers that we originally had, a lot of them were husband and wives uh, that were veterans. Uh, those people are, have, have passed away over the past few years. And it was really hard to get younger people in here, uh, especially in their 20s and 30s. They've got families and jobs and, and, and other obligations to take care of. 
So our biggest thing, what we've got going right now are uh, high school and a, a couple of college kids that need uh, community service hours for graduation. Mm -hmm. uh, usually on Wednesdays, we have two of those come in, uh, sometimes three. Uh, it, so it, it's basically the same handful of people that's running this place day in and day out. The community of Danville has been supportive of the museum's growth and efforts. Veterans who come here appreciate the preservation efforts and the opportunities to connect with one another. For some visitors, it's an opportunity to see her grandfather's uniform for the first time, which is a common occurrence. Probably about four months ago, we had an entire family come in from uh, Urbana or Champaign, and they had their, their father had passed away. They had this World War II uniform. And uh, they brought it in here for me to look at. In the end, we finally got the uniform. Uh, the gentleman was the uh, one who had Interstate 72 dedicated as the Purple Heart Highway over uh, near uh, Champaign. Right after they left, I rigged up a mannequin and got the uniform on. And at the same time when they were here, they even had the grandfather's shoes, or the, fa the father's shoes and the grandson was here too but the shoes were only a size nine and they would not fit on a mannequin. So I, I, I said, you know, I said, we, we really can't use these shoes because this mannequin will be shoeless because they won't fit. And so here, the grandson, they fit the grandson. So he got possession of the shoes. He put on his grandfather's hat. They took a lot of photographs of him standing next, you know, where I think we were holding up his uniform and stuff. But when we were developing the D-Day room, uh, I'm reading the, the guy's biography that was in the New Champagne News Gazette. This guy was at D-Day, and so his uniform is now up here in the D-Day room uh, on, this, on display. The museum is close to downtown Danville and is open for tours Tuesday through Friday from noon to 3 and Saturdays from 10 to 4. Like many local towns, Miram, Indiana is full of history. The town served as Sullivan's first county seat from 1819 to 1842 and also plays host to a Chautauqua Festival, an event organized back in the early 1900s to bring culture to rural communities. But there's something else special about this town of less than 500 people. Come with us down the Heartland Highway as we take a breathtaking view of Miram Buff Park. Kelly Runyon tells the story. There's an awful lot of people who come back to just to be here and to sit on it. You, I don't know as I have ever come up here that there wasn't kids playing on the, uh, as you can hear them now, playing on, on the uh, swings and uh, the different slides, etc. here, or people just sitting on the benches or uh, uh, are on the wall just to talk and visit and see how beautiful it is. Not far from the town's water tower and just off the main drag, you'll find Miram Bluff Park. But this isn't just any park. Yes, there's a set of swings and a merry-go-round to turn your stomach. But what attracts onlookers is this a million dollar view. We are somewhere between 175 and 200 feet uh, above the river. Uh, the park itself really became, it was kind of a place where people came. It was known as the Walnut Grove in its early days. It has expanded some so that it's about three acres and it goes now all the way down to the river and with including that part we probably own better than five or six acres uh, a little over that because we bought some additional land down below and uh, uh, so it, it just so that not only up here is it kind of the park but also down by the river is a, a park the part of the park there too and uh, and it works very, very well.
scenery that goes on for miles and dates back more than a century. Miram was an important river port and a stop on the stage route, the Old Harrison Trail. But being on the river, why the main mode of transportation was uh, by the river until the railroads came in. And so the boats used to stop down on the bottom, on the river down on the bottom of the bluff. And uh, they would, so many of them would uh, spend the night and they would walk up the hill and uh, go down to the Miram house where people could spend the night and they could get a meal. And then in the morning they would go back down and get on the boat and go either north or south on it. There used to be uh, two slaughterhouses down uh, by the river and uh, they would, the guy, farmers would bring in the hogs and uh, one of the early guys writing about it would say the farmer would have a bucket of grain and uh, he would be ahead of his hogs and he would pour the grain on the, the road and they would follow him down the bluff hill to one of the slaughterhouses to a pen. As time passed and the 1900s arrived, so did an event called the Chautauqua, a religious and educational festival meant to bring culture to rural communities. It was this event that really brought Miram Bluff Park to life, and to this day, the town still celebrates the tradition. But in the 19, early 1900s, 1905, I think, was the, and in four, they began to talk about having a Chautauqua. Uh, Chautauqua started in Chautauqua, New York, and it was to be a, a, a training religious center for people. They held these, they established Chautauquas across all of, in, of the United States. They held it for two weeks, and uh, they got some of the key speakers across the nation. William Jennings Bryan was here uh, for two different years speaking, and uh, he didn't win the presidency, but he convinced an awful lot of people of uh, the importance of their participation in government. historian, Paul can tell you a lot of stories about this land that sits high above the Wabash River. As a child and young teen, the park was his outlet, a place to come and enjoy a little peace and serenity. Paul's not the only one. On any given day, you'll find families spending a few moments together or a group of friends sharing a laugh and a look. Then as I grew up as a teenager, uh, this was the place where uh, so many young people uh, came up to enjoy uh, each other. It is not only uh, a beautiful place to be, but such a quiet and restful place. People just like to come and sit on the wall and look at it. It just is always amazing as I, over the years, how it's changed. The land across the river now, because it's in the flood zone, has been turned into uh, back to trees growing and so on on it. But uh, the vastness of the, the prairie was always here and uh, was just always beautiful. And we can see from Palestine, if you look closely you can see Robinson and uh, and at night you can see uh, the refinery all the lights of the refinery over in Robinson but it uh, it has always just been such a peaceful and beautiful spot
staying in Indiana for this next story, we visited the Museum of Miniature Houses. Thanks to a group of people in Carmel, these beautiful pieces were salvaged from garage sales and yard sales and acquired from collectors and creators to be put on display for all to see and appreciate. moved here from Kansas City and they have a very large, um, had already established a large uh, miniature museum and I got into miniatures here uh, again and um, Susie Moffat kept saying we really need a museum that collections were being lost and children either don't want them or don't have the space so they stick them in garage sales or one other vile thing and, um, and then Nancy Lesh who did this house, um, she really was looking for a home for this large house. I mean, this takes a tremendous amount of space. And so they evidently had known each other. And um, so the, by and by, the three of us got together. And we didn't have any money. We didn't have any location. We didn't really have a collection. So, you know, we were just spinning wheels for a while. And then finally, um, we were able to find a building, and um, this building. And, um, <clears throat> you know, just kept going. and. Um, the miniatures of the area actually joined the museum when we had nothing. And so we've always felt very near and dear to them for putting up some money, you know, to get, it, get, us, get us going. And that's how we started. And those who make the detailed creations you see in the Museum of Miniature Houses are referred to as miniaturists. To us, a miniaturist is somebody that makes tiny things in scale. Um, usually, we usually use one inch to the foot or a half an inch to foot. A lot of people are even doing a quarter inch to the foot. Very, very different scales. And um, it's, the purpose is to make it as close to the real thing as possible so that your eye, one of the best ways to tell if something is done well is you take a picture of it and if you can't tell that it's, you know, the menu factured by little fingers, um, then you've done a good job. Examples of a job well done are demonstrated in the houses displayed throughout the museum's six rooms. Houses range from more modern to antique, like this one made in the mid-1800s. There's always something new to see as about 20% of the houses are rotated out three to four times each year so others can be featured. A common misconception about these houses, however, is that they're just for girls or children of a certain age. Literally, I would say 2 to 92. Um, it's fairly rare that we have somebody come in that doesn't find some aspect of it that uh, they, they really enjoy. I always say the men are dragged in and then they're dragged out because they've, they become so entranced by, you know, many of the aspects. Um, and, you know, they come in thinking, oh, this is for little girls, and then they realize, you know, it's, it's pretty serious art. And so they, you know, they really enjoy it, too. The art of making miniatures has been enjoyed by many and even dates all the way back to the Egyptians. Even the Egyptians made miniatures of items to put in the tombs for the afterlife. So it, it goes way back. And then as it, in the 1800s, it became pretty popular in Europe, primarily England and Germany, and they did do a lot with, sometimes they called them baby houses, sometimes the carpenter of the estate would make this wonderful home for the children to play with. And then also in the 1700s, the French aristocracy collected very, very fine miniatures. They would have these fabulous curio cabinets and to show off their, their wonderful miniature items. Um, so it's been around a long time. And then in the 19, I would say 1970s, um, it be, started becoming a hobby. A lot of times we called it um, sort of in the closet because people would be doing it, making miniatures, make, having a house, they wouldn't tell anybody. So nobody knew that they were even doing it. Um, and then by the 1880s, I mean, I'm sorry, 1980s, um, it had really become very popular. In fact, at one time it was considered the third largest hobby in the world just behind stamps and coins. Perhaps it's attention to detail or working with their hands that people love, but all of these projects require stamina as some can take up to 1,000 man hours to complete. But no matter what the method is, chances are that most miniaturists enjoy the challenge. 
I think it's partly the challenge and it's also something you just, the rest of the world sort of melts away and you, you just, you become so intrigued with it. The first thing I made was a little sewing machine and I had four children still living at home and they'd hang over me because they'd never seen me do anything with my hands. I don't even really sew. And they couldn't believe I was doing this. And yet, to me, it was, it was a real challenge. You know, I wanted every detail as perfect as I could make it. And I think that's, that's true with every, everybody that gets into this. The museum, located in Carmel's downtown arts district, is open Wednesday through Sunday, about 49 weeks per year. They hope to add an addition soon so they can display many more mini houses. That wraps up this episode of Heartland Highways. We hope you've enjoyed this week's adventures. For more adventures anytime, you can visit our website at weiu.net. We'll see you next week. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits. Opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning. Available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114.